don't know why you're here this morning. I know that sometimes people come to church and they think, well, one of the things that a preacher will talk about is faith. And uh, you're right, today's title is called Stretch Your Faith. And so we're going to talk about faith a lot. You may walk in here and it may be as natural to you to walk into this building as it is to brush your teeth or to go to work or to, or to watch OSU OU play football down to the last second. I get all that. For some of you, this may not be very natural. And I understand that too. Maybe you came here today because someone drug you here. And that happens from time to time. Maybe you're checking us out. Maybe you're wondering what kind of songs we sing and what do we talk about. Maybe you're searching for something and that can be understandable too and you're not sure exactly what it is. Maybe you're on a journey and it's kind of at a kind of rocky place right now and so you turn to the church and you turn to the Lord. You've turned to the right place and the right person in turning to Jesus. There are some of you who simply don't want to be here because you knew that November is the month that I talk about money. I've been around now for three years, this is my or second November, and so you know. And uh, you're thinking, oh, I don't want to be here, but somebody drugged me here. Or maybe you're thinking, okay, I'll just make the best of it and I'll get through it because preachers always talk about money. With my luck, he'll talk a lot about money this week. And that is all the church ever talks about is my money. And so you expect me to preach with one hand in the Bible and another hand in your wallet. I get that. A lot of people have that kind of jitteriness about it. But once you get to know me very well, one of the things that you'll know and understand is I can rarely do two things at once, okay? So I'm going to preach what the Bible says and keep my hand out of your wallet, okay? And that's a promise. And what we're going to talk today about is faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's what it means to have faith. And of course, that whole chapter in Hebrews chapter 11 is example after example after example of faith. And all of those journeys, like we talked about in the prayer, all of those journeys are different. And they all look different. None of them look the same. It's not a cookie cutter kind of deal at all when it comes to faith. Instead, we have faith because we believe that God exists and we know that he, earn, he does reward those who earnestly seek him. And so that verse pre, pre, presupposes that all of us have a decision to make about our life and that is, is there really a God or isn't there? And that again can be part of your journey. And some people struggle with that. Is there really a God or isn't there one? I read this story this week about a young teacher who explained to her class of children that she was an atheist. And when she did that, she asked the class if they were atheists too. And wanting to please the teacher, almost every child in the room raised their hand and said, yes, we're an atheist. And uh, that was except for one little girl named Lucy. And little Lucy kind of sat there quietly and she didn't go along with the crowd. And the teacher, bold enough to ask her why she didn't raise her hand, and she says, because I'm not an atheist. And the teacher said, well, then what are you? And she said, well, I'm a Christian. And the teacher then got a little put out by that answer. And so she asked Lucy why she was a Christian. And Lucy said, well, I was brought up knowing and loving Jesus. And my mom is a Christian and my dad is a Christian. So I'm a Christian. And the teacher became a little bit more angry. And she says, that's no reason. And in front of all these kids in this class, she said, what if your mom was a moron and your dad was a moron? What would you be then? And Lucy kind of paused and smiled and said, then I guess I'd be an atheist. <laughs> you know what? People struggle with what they believe, don't they? And everybody's on a different place in their journey. That little girl, a pretty sharp little girl in a lot of ways. I think most of us have been raised with some kind of concept of God in our homes and in our lives. But just because your homes are places where you pray for meals or watch the right TV shows or go to church once or twice a week doesn't mean that you turn out to be Christian. This is a personal journey. This is a personal encounter with God. This doesn't have anything to do with the person you're sitting next to, in front of, or behind. What you believe about God is between you and God. And it's between you and God because it's a personal relationship with Jesus. And I think sometimes we have to be reminded of that, especially as we become parts of bodies of families like this in churches. We see people come to the church and everything. We want people to know this and to know this clear and as free and as strong as they can. People do not come to the church for salvation. They come to Jesus for salvation. And that has to be 
reiterated to all of us all the time because we get enamored with buildings, we get enamored with locations, we get enamored with making things better and easier and warmer and everything else. When it all comes down to nothing, all of it can be stripped away. And guess what? We still have a Cherokee Hills Christian church. It's us. It's who we are on the journey, on the journey with God. In the Old Testament, God's people really had a hard time with this. They were blessed by God from the very beginning, but they seemed to ping pong from belief to unbelief and back to belief and to unbelief. And one moment they'd say, yes, God, we love you. The next moment they would say, we don't love you. And it seemed like that much of the time the enemies of God ruled much of the day. And especially when you get into 1 Kings, and that's where we're at today in chapter 17. This is the day of Ahab. And if you know much about Ahab, you know that he was a terrible, evil king who was married to a terrible, evil queen by the name of Jezebel, okay? I've never had anybody, when I asked them at the hospital, so what did you name her, say, we named her Jezebel, okay? And I'm really glad because I think I would probably try to stop him from doing that. She was a mess. She was terrible. And Elijah was this prophet that God was using to teach people about God's blessing in their life. And so he preached in the shadow of Ahab and in the shadow of Jezebel. And even in 17.1, comes to Ahab with a word from God, which we find early there in, in verse 1, in which he says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. That's it. No dew, no rain. Now, we've had some drought and had a little bit of drought here over the past few years, but that's nothing compared to what this is here at all. This is no water from anywhere for several years. And this was the word of the Lord being spoken to the evil king. And I thought, man, that's a, that's a tough message there to, to give Ahab. But then it says in verse 2 that the word of the Lord came to Elijah and he says, leave here and turn eastward and hide in the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and you will drink from the brook, that, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Now, there's a couple things I want you to see here that I don't want you to miss. It's easy to miss these things. Okay, first of all, he's leaving the presence of Ahab and going into hiding. And where's he going to go? Well, he's going to logically go where there's water, because he's got to have water. You, gotta, you have to have water to survive on. And so he's going to go to this brook, and God's going to provide water in this brook. But not only that, he's going to provide food through these ravens. Now, a lot of people think when they read and kind of skim by that, that God provided ravens for him to eat. No, 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 because ravens were unclean animals, and Elijah could not eat them at all. But it says in verse 5, so he did what the Lord had told him, and he went to Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. What was the role of the ravens? It was not to be eaten or to be barbecued, it was to bring meat and bread morning and night to Elijah and take care of him. Now, we live out north of town here, about six, seven miles across the Turnpike, and, uh, and most of you know we live in a pretty small subdivision that's now almost full, and there's a school, but there's not much else around there at all, except in the last three months, they opened up a brand new Sonic. <sighs> <laughs> and it, is, it just happens to be right on the way to work and right on the way home from work. And so sometimes my car just goes in there, you know? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll drive in there. I don't really do it very much in the morning at all. I got other places to stop at in the morning. Uh, here I am now confessing my sins to my wife. But, you know, sometimes in the afternoon, maybe I'll go home and lay down for a while and I won't eat and then I'll get in the car and it's only, it's only, it's less than six-tenths of a mile. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, you, it's, it doesn't cost much to go to Sonic. And, uh, and they got these jumbo chicken things that are really, really, really good, you know. And so I'll swing in there and get them and eat them on the way to the office and cherry, cherry limeade or something like that. I don't do it, I don't do it every day, okay? So don't judge me <laughs> at all. It's maybe once a week or so, uh, or so. <laughs> But I thought about Sonic when I thought about Elijah. And I thought, you know, these ravens were like his Sonic. I mean, 
These ravens brought him food in the morning and food in the evening and brought him everything that he needed. And I thought, how cool is that? Now, it was not a 20-course meal. and There isn't anything at Sonic that is as good as where a lot of places are that you can eat here in town. But it was available, and it was enough, and it was well within the dietary laws that God had laid out for his people, just like Sonic is for dietary laws for me, right? Amen? Amen. Occasionally an ice cream or something like that. And I just think it's amazing that God not only sends him to the brook, but he also sends the ravens to him with meat morning and night and provides for him and provides over and over, day after day, night after night. He had it. Then we come to verse 7, and it says, Sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And that makes sense because it was drought. And then the word of the Lord came to him and said, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. Now, two things there you've got to remember. Number one, go to the region of Sidon and, and go to the city of Zarephath, which would have been the headquarters of one woman by the name of Jezebel. So here is God now who is actually sending the prophet back into the battle zone with Jezebel. You know, don't worry about it. I got it, got, it all, got it all covered. I'm going to take care of you. And it says there, I have directed a widow to stay there, and she will supply you with food. And, of course, if you knew much about at all life in that day when widows didn't have anybody else to take care of them, they rarely ever had anything to share with anybody ever. And so it kind of would have been a surprise, I think, to Elijah. So it says in verse 10 that he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and asked, Would you bring to me a little water in a jar that I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, and would you please bring me a piece of bread? Bring me some water out of the jar and bring me some bread. I don't know what this widow was thinking at the time that she was out there gathering sticks, except that we find out later in 1 Kings 17 that she had a little boy and she literally was on her last leg and she was literally going to make a meal, which would be their last meal, and then they would die. You just think about how dark it would have been for her and then for God's man to show up and to say, hey, I need some water and I need some bread and take that flour that you've got and mix it up for me so that I can have a little bit of bread. God shows up in some really amazing ways, doesn't he? And here he shows up in this woman's way and in Elijah's way or path, journey, if you want to say it that way. And he shows up in a really significant way. Surprising in a lot of ways. And I bet if I took the time and gave you each a mic and asked you to just share a time when God might have showed up in your life in some surprising way, most of us, if not all of us, would have stories and we'd be able to say, Oh, yeah, I can remember when God showed up that time or when God showed up this time. I remember when I had to have a knee replacement replaced a second time, and I thought, man, this is going to kill us financially because it happened right at the wrong time of the year and all the things were, it was so messed up, and it had knocked me down and made me so sick, and I'd been hospitalized for uh, several weeks and out of work and all kinds of stuff, and I thought, what am I going to do? And I remember going to my follow-up uh, uh, appointment about five, six weeks after surgery, and then walking out to the desk. And I, I, I have always tried to not be that person that tries to sneak around the desk and hope nobody sees me and I can get out the door and then they can mail me the bill. And so I just went up to the desk and I said, okay, so what am I going to owe for all this? And they pulled it all up and they said, you don't owe anything for it. Nothing. Zero. And then she looked at me and she said, what happened to you is our responsibility, not yours. And I remember just going, really? I haven't really ever heard that before. But what a moment for God to show up right there. And I remember kind of limping out and going home. And it wasn't four or five weeks later that Pam broke her leg. And we went through that whole thing. And so we were right on one on top of the other. And never paid a dime for months and months and months of therapy. Two major surgeries. Uh, all kinds of hospitalization for her, never paid a dime because it was somebody else's responsibility. And then I remember having a care group in our church at the time, and uh, the leader came and talked to me and said, hey, we want to do something for you. What could we do for you that would help you right now during this time? Because, you know, it's just really crazy. And I'm like, man, I don't know. My wife's in a chair. 
I'm going to Sonic every chance I get, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's not a good situation, but I don't tell you, I don't know what's going on. And I just happened to mention, you know what? If you guys could figure out how to get somebody to come in this house and clean it from head to toe once a month, I know that would make her so happy. And it doesn't have to be every week. It would just be once a month. So they went out, and they got somebody to come in twice a month and clean, deep clean our house from one end to the other. For six months, they did that. And I thought, man, God shows up. And you know, when sometimes you're beginning to think, I, I don't know if I have enough faith anymore, then what happens is those seeds of faith that you've planted inspire others to take steps of faith that bless you on your journey. Did you hear that? The seeds of faith that you've planted inspire others to take steps of faith that, you, that get planted to inspire you on your journey. That's how it works. That's that reciprocation that happens between us and God. And here we have this picture of God taking care of Elijah for some time, however long that is, and then he wants him to go and talk to this widow. But it isn't about Elijah at that point. It's about the widow. And it says there that she says in verse 12, As surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour in a little jar and a little olive oil in a jug. And I'm gathering a few sticks here to take him home and to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. That's the deal. I'm going to make the last meal and we're going to die. And here's what Elijah says to her in verse 13. Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Man, what a proclamation that is. And how, how powerful that is that, that she, he would say that to her and she would respond and God's response would be, I will take care of you until the day I start pouring water back on this ground. I will take care of you. You will always have enough. Elijah always had enough with the ravens. Now you'll always have enough with Elijah. You never have to worry about it at all. And what Elijah is saying here is something very significant about faith. And you can fill this in in your blanks and it's this. That faith can overcome fear, or fear can overcome faith. And that's part of the decision making that every one of us have to do on our journey. Are we going to be people of fear, or are we going to be people of faith? And I can tell you that I've lived long enough now to know what fear looks like. And I've lived long enough now to wonder, okay, when's the, where's the next meal going to come from or where are the next bill is going to get paid from and all of these things happen in our life. And what I've understood from learning from God over and over and over is it's better to live by faith than it is to live by fear. It is to put your faith in God. And some of you are dealing with that in your life right now, even though the steps of faith are completely unknown, you're still taking steps of faith. You know, I think one of the most faith-filled things that we ever do in life, and yet we don't talk about it much this way, is getting married. You know, you stand on the stage, and you got the preacher up there, and everybody's dressed, and they're beautiful and everything else, and you say, do you do in your cherished love? Will you promise to do this the rest of your life? Oh, yeah, I will. I'll do that. Don't you worry. And she'd say it to her, and she says, oh, I'll do it forever. Nobody really knows, because that's all really a step of faith. It's a step of faith and a step and a journey that you're taking with somebody. But you're putting your faith in God that they will lead you into that kind of relationship. And while we're committed to her and we believe in him, honestly, when you say, I do, you're stepping off a cliff. You really are. Now, I don't say that in marriage ceremonies because it's kind of dark, you know, <laughs> a little bit. I might try the sonic thing sometimes, see if that works, but... You know, the stepping off a cliff thing, I don't do that. But in premarital counseling stuff, a lot of times I'll say, you, you realize what you're getting yourself into? Because it's not all just like you think it looks like it is at all. Well, I grew up in a home, and my mom loved my dad, and my dad loved my mom, and they never said a crossword to each other, ever yelled, fought, anything else. And what I want to say is, let me see your hearing aids. 
They are just really good at hiding those things from you. Because that's the way relationships are. That's the way journeys are in our life. It's how things sometimes happen. But here's what Elijah says that I think is so important to the widow. Do not let fear get in the way of your faith. Do not let fear get in the way of your faith. Step out in faith and watch God work. And I think he was thinking about that with this woman in mind. Let me ask the question, well, what good is this going to do this woman? Well, let's think about it. She makes her bread, they eat it and they die. Or God offers her another alternative, which is make the bread, give some to Elijah, always have enough to make for yourself and your son until the drought is over. In other words, Fear means that it, the, the end of things are near. You're going to die. Faith always means it's just the beginning. You've got to choose between faith and fear. The woman, as we read in the text, says in verse 15, it says, She went away and did as Elijah had told her, and so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. You've heard me say this a hundred times. I'll say it another hundred times in the next two years. God keeps his promises. Amen? He always keeps his promises. And he promised this woman that if she would live in faith and help supply food and drink to the prophet, that she would always have enough for herself and for her son. And that's exactly what happened. I'm sure there were times she might have been mixing up the oil and water and all that and thinking, man, this just doesn't make sense at all. And How's this working? There's got to be something sneaky going on here or something like that. But that's not true at all for him or for her. She didn't need to be sensible. She needed to be faithful. Be faithful to the obedience that God has given her. And so what a great challenge for all of us. When I think about how it's going to be for us in living our life, we have to remember that God's got a plan for us. And that sometimes releasing things, that's why I love the song that that Micah picked at the end, I surrender all. Man, Is that not just the exercise of life, is learning how to surrender all? You see, if you try to keep everything that you have, what you end up is clutching everything. But when you release it to God and open up your hands, there's peace, there's trust, there's an obedient heart that God blesses. We'll talk about that in just a second. Just because you and I choose to surrender all. So I want you to think about that, and as we kind of wrap up this message this morning, I hope this will uh, challenge you a little bit. It says there that she went away and did as Elijah had told her, and there was food every day. What's involved in this journey? Two things, pretty simple things. Number one, you got to have trust. You have to trust. God, from the very beginning, has asked his people to trust him. Trust me. Trust me to give you the very best life ever in this garden. I will build this garden for you and it will be the best thing ever in the world. I promise you it will be. Just trust me and do what I tell you to do and you'll be okay. And guess what? They didn't trust him. And guess what? They ended up being kicked out of the garden because they didn't trust him. Trust me that I will show up in your life. Now You may be in a widow-like moment in your life right now and nothing may feel or look right, but what God keeps saying to you over and over is just trust me, just trust me, I've got this. And you know what? He had it for her and he had it for that little boy and every single day she took that oil and that flour and she made some bread and she had enough for Elijah and for them every single day, every single day I'm sure she thought, I really have no choice but to trust God and sometimes that is the best place to be in life where you have no choice but to trust God. It's the way we all should live. We've talked about this, that everything that we have is his. He owns it all, Psalm 24, 1. We've talked about how we have to have trust, and sometimes that means stepping out in front of the blessings that God provides, and that means not only trusting him, but having the second thing, which is obedience. Obedience. Now, you know that. From from being a little tiny kid all the way to the age I am today, I'm not especially fond of the word obey. 
I don't know about you. I don't like people telling me what to do. That's not a generational thing, by the way. That is a human thing. Nobody likes to be bossed around at all. And yet all of us have bosses. I don't know how many times I've looked at my kids or looked at other people and said, you will always have somebody to tell you what to do. So you might as well just give in to it now. Okay? And somebody will ask me at church and say, how are you? I'll say, you know, I'm doing what I'm told. You know? <laughs> and you, 99.9% .9 of the time, that's the best place to be. To just do what you're told. To be obedient. To have an obedient heart, especially to God and to those closest to you. And that widow, she had a choice to make. She could either obey God or die. That was really what it came down to. I remember last week and appreciated so much what Kevin Ingram had to say from Manhattan Christian College. And you remember that he quoted from Malachi 3, which offers a command and a challenge. And the, the scripture goes like this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. That is a promise from God that if you will commit in your life to tithe, to give 10% of everything that God has given you back to the kingdom and let God use it to multiply it. And one of the things I love about what we saw in the video, I hope you saw it, is many of the gifts that were given through the Great Commission offering last year were multiplied two and three times, matched by other generous people. So what was 1,000 turned out to be 3,000, and what was 1,000 turned out to be 2,000, and that's how it could just expand, because that's what God does. That simple command to tithe brings so much heartburn to so many people and it always elicits the same kind of conversation about the journey again, which is, hey, you don't know my budget. You don't know what I make. There's no way that I can tithe at all. I get all that. I really, really do. But let me call you to do the things that we have done in our life and that many people in this church have done in their life, and that is stretch your faith in God. Stretch your faith in God. Make changes to your budget. Deal with those things. Grow in the grace of giving. Even strive to excel in the grace of giving, as 2 Corinthians 9 talks about. And here's why. Because if you do that, God always promises to bless you. Now, this is not some kind of dog and pony show at all. The truth is that God always blesses his obedient people always does, and God keeps his promises. I have a really good friend who uh, I got to know the last 20 years or so, and uh, at first when I got to know him, when I first came to the church in Owasso, he didn't come all the time. His wife came all the time, but he, he wasn't really for all that, and he had some things going on in his life that were pretty rough, some alcohol issues and different stuff, and his wife just prayed and prayed and prayed and she came faithfully and served and served and served and did some amazing things for the work of God. And eventually he started showing up. He'd come and he'd show up and he'd sit. And he'd show up and he'd sit. And he had one kind of job and it was a really good job but he decided to get out of that job and instead buy a business. And so he bought a business and God blessed his business. Oh, my goodness. One of the biggest kinds of businesses in the Tulsa area is this business that he was a part of for almost 20 years. And it began to be that he began to grow so much in his generosity that he would be asking me, when are you going to start preaching on giving again? And most people want to run to the doors, you know, and get out and take vacations and all that stuff, but not Dale. Dale didn't want to do that. So you gotta, you got to let them know, Charlie. you got to let them know. And we ended up doing lots of yearly things like we do now. We did capital campaigns and did all kinds of things and raised lots of money. And he would always say the same thing to me at the end of every one of those sermons. He'd say, Charlie, don't ever forget to preach the blessings. Don't ever forget to preach the blessings. Just preach the blessings and the people will give. And we saw that happen. And God had blessed their life so much and they are so generous and he had dedicated his business to God and he gave and he gave and he gave and he gave because he trusted God and because he obeyed God. But one of the reasons that he gave was is he never wanted to be out of the stream of the blessings. He 
You know, some of you are on the sidelines watching blessings go by you all the time, and you're wondering, how can I get a little bit of that? You know how you can get a little bit of that? Trust God and obey him. And those blessings start showing up. I don't know what they look like for you. I can tell you a little bit about what they've looked like for us. They look different for everybody's journey. But preach the blessings. Live out the blessings. Give because there are blessings. Not only blessings for you in giving, but amazingly what we've seen, and one of the reasons we've done the videos the way we've done in the last six weeks is we want you to see the blessings of your giving across the world. Clear across the world. We've got kids that we're paying for in Bible college that are going to be great leaders for the church because of your giving. We've got people that are leading people to Christ in Taiwan and in India and in Haiti and all of these places feeding people. We got a note this week about there were several of us that were asked to participate in kind of a deal where we gave a little bit of money and it went to the farmers in Haiti who uh, would plant peanut plant peanuts, and then they would have a crop, and then that crop would become another crop, and all that, so I, I just call it the peanut ministry at all, but I got this note this week, and it was just like, how awesome that's been this last year, and how many people have been touched by it, just because it took, I don't know what it was, $85 or something like that, and just said, give it to them, see what they can do with it. Well, you know what they're doing with it? They're feeding each other with that. You know what ha happens when you feed each other with that kind of thing? And I don't have all the details right, I know I don't, but you know, what happens is, is when you start feeding people, they start thinking about God and less about their stomach. And a lot of times that's the very start of something that changes an entire generation and state, a community, or even a nation's entire way of life. So that's why we're calling you to stretch. Next week we'll end this series. We'll talk about the impact of stretching. But today I want to call you to stretch your faith. As you consider the Great Commission offering and as you begin to hear about the 2019 budget, begin to think a little bit about where you're at in your life and where you're at with trusting God and obeying God and where the blessings are coming from, I, just, I want you to consider stretching because you never know what happens when you get out of your comfort zone and you stretch. I read this recently about a man who was given an opportunity that was far beyond his means and ability. And he argued with God and struggled with people about whether or not to take a step of faith that would change his life forever. So he went to a mentor of his who had a lifetime of experience, and he never forgot what this mentor said to him. He said, and it's in the bottom of your bulletin, if you take on this task, you will find that you are out of your depth, and you will find that you prove God in ways that you never thought possible. If you take this on this task, you will find that you are out of your depth, and that you will find that you prove God in ways you never thought possible. I think that's what maybe a widow in Zarephath learned in her life. She took a step of faith, and she was way out of her element, and she proved God. As a matter of fact, at the end of chapter 17, and this is just extra, and you have to go back and read the rest of the book, or the rest of the chapter to understand this, but just listen to these words. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. You know, that's part of the journey, isn't it, for all of us when we finally get to that place. And those words for that man were the catalyst of a faith-filled step that led him into opportunities he could never imagine at all. He was challenged to take his seeds of faith and not become overcome, be overcome by fear, but instead to live by faith. Just you stand, please? Just bow your heads right where you're at for a moment. Lord, this, this battle zone in our lives and in our spirit is very real. Fear or faith. And I don't think there's anybody that's exempt from it at all. We all deal with it. Would you help us, God, as we consider these coming days and weeks, would you help us to really ask the hard questions of our own soul? Do I live in fear or do I live in faith? And as we stretch and as we grow and as we excel, 
may it be because, may it be because we live in faith to honor you. We live by trusting in you and by obeying you, by believing your promises that you will bless us and many others across the world as we stretch. But may it be all be done for the right reason, because of faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This song.